Well, God giving birth. <laughs> I suppose, do, do most people here know about God giving birth? The thing is, what I tend to say is my first initiation to the goddess was a natural home birth to my second child. And in that, I mean, Vicky Noble writes, said once, that the original shaman is a birthing woman. The thing is, when you are in, in labor or giving birth, you are walking between worlds. You are risking your life, bringing this life, this spirit from the other world into this realm. And it was, and it's no wonder, you know, that the witch hunts that were attempted to destroy this knowledge that women had, the ancient priestesses, were also midwives and healers, astrologers, and everything else, you know. But that they specifically attempted to take away the, the, what do you call it, uh, desacralize this experience, because in the ancient world of the goddess, women gave birth at the ancient sacred. Um, sat structures, you know, in the ancient sacred places for the goddess, you know. And what my experience there was totally unexpected was that during this birth, I saw great masses of absolutely radiant blackness, darkness, like velvet and darkness, mixing and changing, going forth and back with great sheets of absolutely radiant, luminous light. Forth and back, forth and back, forth and back. And of course at the time, 1961, this is 1961, of course I didn't think that this is a goddess, I didn't even know about the goddess at the time. But it's clear to me that what I saw was a goddess in the most elemental energy form appearing to me in that state. But if, that, if this happened to me, ignorant as I was, do you know what I mean? And, and what did ancient women, you know, who were aware about things actually experience? You know? And being helped by shamankas and priestesses and so on. Anyway, this was my first initiation to the goddess. It changed my life. It was two years later I found the white goddess, I wrote the graves. <coughs> and <coughs> so this painting I did in 1968, before the women's movement, before the goddess movement, before the women's arts movement, and six foot high. And I was attempted to make an image of a divine woman who was in a specific race. Turned out she's more African than anything. I didn't know at the time that all of humanity actually originates from Africa and from perhaps a handful of African women. Our real ancestors, the first great mother, was an African woman, but I didn't know that at the time. And uh, so, anyway, this painting has been in a lot of trouble over the years, perhaps you heard. In fact, 1973, I had a, we had a pornography school in Scotland Yard. <laughs> And the public prosecutor to decide whether I should be taken to court for obscenity and blasphemy. But no one asked me what I think is obscene. But I think a dead man hanging on a cross is something pretty obscene, if you ask me. <laughs> and, and be worshipped, you know. For bleeding, women bleed every month for the sake of life. We give our lifeblood to bring new life into the world, yeah? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, I can't remember. Was it, did, did it have to get taken down? No, what happened in the end was that I wasn't taken to court. But I tend to say I wouldn't have minded standing up in the court and ask where those men thought they came from, a plastic bag or a woman. <laughs> 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 but you know, for example, like the reason they call hell, they call hell, they talk about hell, the Christians call hell. Hell was originally the domain of hell the great underworld, other world, radiant, shining goddess of the north. Her name was Hel. But to the Christians, it was hell to be born of a woman. That was hell. That is why they call it hell. The Sultan. And hell was set aside, you know, as a real, by difficult and rebellious women and slaves and so on were assigned to by all the sort of great warriors and things well to Valhalla, you know, to the to the real Wudin. The Sultan, I mean, this hero of hell was specifically real for rebellious and sinful women. Do you know? Except for women who died in childbirth. The kind of women who died in childbirth were the only ones who were seen as heroic. You know? <laughs> anyway, no, so I wasn't actually taken to court because it was a huge scandal. It was in every newspaper. This painting has been reproduced in I don't know how many art books and the books ever since. Which is interesting in a way because many of those art books is the only picture of the goddess that is represented whatsoever ever in any of those books. 
So that's very important in itself, you know? So this one has been persecuted over many years. But now it's seen as a classic, as a great painting, as a very important, you know what I mean, like a very important painting. And it's now hanging in the north of Sweden, in the Women's Arts Museum, which you left in the north of Sweden, and it's seen as the important, the major important work in that collection, yeah? But now, of course, the joke is that the people who now complain about this, it's, it's new complaints about these paintings, from Muslims who have moved up to North Sweden. What is that? This they think is something horrendous. So, I mean, you, you, it's, it's never right, is it? Never right. You know? <laughs> this is an Aboriginal Australian mother giving birth. Hindu policy. I hadn't seen any of these images when I did my painting. It was entirely based on my own experience. This is the pre aztec goddess giving birth together, and this is also an image of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, but that's the whole other story about how I met Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico, and, and I totally, 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 totally worshipped her. She's an indigenous mother, she's not married to <coughs> the church. She's a dark indigenous mother. And she said to the Aztec people, I am the mother of your people. She never said, I am the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> you know, like at Lourdes, you know, I'm the Immaculate Conception. You know? <laughs> anyway, that's another, you know, I could be here for five days too. <laughs> Which I'm sure Jill could have too, and everyone else would as well. You know? This is from, of course, from Shatariyu in Turkey. Anatolia. And by the way, Anadoli, Pardemel, means land of the mothers. Anatolia means land of the mothers. And no doubt the archaeologists will say, well, she hasn't got breasts, you know, it's a man. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from uh, Chateau de Youth as well, I think. Found in, uh, in, in a grain bin. The great corn mother, which is in birth, sitting on a lion throne. But of course, another side about this, who's talking about lions? And I mean, the lioness is the most ferocious, ferocious fighter and hunter, you know? And so, I mean, the goddess is very often has been represented as a great lioness, like Sekhmet, and she's ferocious. And the thing is, the lioness will fight for her cubs, like the lion goddess will fight for her, for her, for her children, for, her, for humanity, you know? For your, for human beings, well, not she wouldn't fight for human beings now, I'm sure. But you know, in the ancient world. Oh yeah. And of course, that's another long story about how he, he had a, a major conference in Bristol. But, but we are planning to have this 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 uh, meeting now in uh, uh, discussing the lost politics of the goddess movement at the Suburbist Community Center in Bristol. In uh, when was it? Uh, when did it September. Yeah. Well, it's in this same place, the Suburbist Community Center. We had a big conference, women's conference, 1993, that we called Breaking the Chains, Breaking the Taboos, Breaking the Silence. And it was also very much about racism as well. It was most of the workshop was run by women. We had a women's spirituality and politics group that was happening in Bristol for 10 years that we called Arma Marwa, Women's Spirituality and Politics. And so we, we organized this conference, but as part of this conference, we planned several actions. And the action that I took the initiative to was because I'd had, I'd had this fantasy for about 30 years of walking into a cathedral or a church during Mass and stopping the Mass and saying to the bishop or the priest, you are blaspheming against the mother. Yeah? I'd had this fantasy, but I didn't want to do it on my own because that's afraid I get dragged off to a mental hospital <laughs> or something that would be any use to anyone, you know. Something I've been avoiding all my life is falling into the hands of a psychiatric professional to tell you that would make me sweet on me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> or I would make me sweet on them. <laughs> but, um, so I, I said this to a group of women and then we planned this conference, you see, and they got really excited. So it went all the way up and down the country, in action in the cathedral, you see. So I, 
On the night of the first day of the Imperial Conference, about 15 women or 20 women gathered to discuss doing this very action that I had had this fantasy about. At which point I was getting scared because the class leader in the five minutes walk from where I live. On my, I lived on my own in Bristol at the time, and I was getting scared, you know. And, uh, but I couldn't disown it because it was my own. <laughs> so, and they decided they wanted to do this. Next day was Sunday. Yeah? And, and the thing is, some of the women were really powerful voices and they knew all the verses of Burning Times. That's when I decided, great, this is the right women. There were anarchist women involved in anti rope demonstrations, sitting up trees and so on. You know what I mean? Strong, fearless women. That's the sort of women I've been waiting for. Not to do this for me. <laughs> yes, you know. So, so, so we, we gathered, I, I was feeling sick all night. I could barely sleep. I thought I was getting flu. I didn't know what to do with no bike. I hope they don't come. I don't want them to turn up. I also made a banner saying the beginning of the end of patriarchy we got given birth on it, you see. Of course, because it was Christians who had persecuted this painting all these years. So, so anyway, so of course 50 women turned up. <laughs> so we gathered around the tree, centered ourselves, and then walked into the cathedral. But oh, mass was going on, and we walked on the side, you see, in the dark. They didn't see what we were doing. Until we were standing right in front of the high altar, all of us. With me in the center, yeah. We got in birth. <laughs> and then of course, uh, they thought I was the ring leader, you see, um, which of course I was, I suppose, in a way. And um, mm. and the uh, Dean of Bristol had a rap an argument with me. Like he was saying, you know, we are having mass we are having a, a mass here or something. I said, I said something about that week where we are going to do something here, you know. So he said, It's my cathedral, he said. <laughs> So I said, I'm sorry, but all the ancient cathedrals are built on the ancient sacred sites of the goddess. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, there was an old Saxon church apparently there yeah. in the past. I didn't know that at the time when I said that. You know. <laughs> so, and anyway, so, and then a little woman comes and she said, the police. You know. And he said, no, he didn't want to have 50 women dragged out to the cathedral kicking and screaming. We haven't done, we didn't do it as a precedent. We haven't called a press, nothing like that. You know what I mean? We weren't doing it as a stunt or nothing like that. But of course, if it had been carried out kicking and screaming, we would have a camera. <laughs> a sensation, a sensation, a sensation. Mm. But anyway, so he sort of said, he gave up and he said, What do you want to do? And I said, We, we just want to sing a song, I said. So we belted it up. Okay. <laughs> 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 I really didn't know what hit them, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I think there were some women on their knees, or the <laughs> some <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want it, you know, <laughs> the witches returned. You know? <laughs> but anyway, the point is that neither the Protestant nor the Catholic Church have ever, ever apologized for the genocide of witches during 300 years in Europe. Never. I think the Pope has done a sort of feeble try at an apology to the heretics that are persecuted, but the word witches was never on his lips. Do you know? So, and anyway, so at the end, you know, I sort of felt about right, you know, we, I give him my word, we just want to sing the songs to be left. As we were leaving, I was saying, good tidings, the end of the Godfathers, you know, to the congregation. <laughs> and, <laughs> And as you got to the front door, that was this old man. I was telling people, this is the old man. I said, you are old enough to know better than this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it's because I'm old enough that I'm doing this. <laughs> because the point is, as long as you are young, it seems that charming and rebellious, and you know, you're growing out of it, and blah, blah, you know? But when you're my age, it's not quite as charming, and you're not, never going to change. <laughs> you know? Anyway. <laughs> And that is a photograph that one of the women actually managed to take as we were walking up there. So you can see there is a dean of the Bristol who was sort of looking at the poster. Well, one of the women, actually Anne Morgan from Glastonbury, stayed on in, in, the, in, in the audience to find out what, what he said after we had left. And he said, well, look upon this as a sort of commercial break, like that on television. <laughs> <laughs> now we are going to get back to the real business. And these women were deluded by <coughs> Jungian ideas. But none of us are not to be depressed by Jungian ideas. <laughs> <laughs> just which, I mean, it's, it was just hilarious. And then I heard there was a group of gay men who are, 
who are Christians who say, come back, come back, it's so boring. <laughs> So we got back to some of this community center. There was about six or eight women sitting there drumming. And we danced wildly for about three hours solid. The energy was phenomenal after we did this. But what we felt was that we had done something really important. It was almost like some sort of collective consciousness, women's collective consciousness. We had opened a gap. We had made a rent somewhere in this patriarchal we, you don't know what I mean, some, we just felt that we done something really important some, for all women that we did this, you know, magically, or whatever, you know. So I always tell this story, you know, to give, and when I was in the Czech Republic and I told the story, one of the women like this has decided they are going to do that there, uh, in Moravia. You know, uh, Hannah Pokorna, she said, I'm going to do that. <laughs> 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 because it's much more careful as I can do it, are But anyway, talking about the region, and from Africa, this Peggy I called Marwa, African mother of us all. And she's put third and second. Well, anyway, it's been a lot of talk about birds and serpents, so I'm not going into that. This is my interpretation of African sun goddess. Uh, Sky Queen Mountain Mother is from Andalusia, South Spain, it's Sierra Nevada. Black Madonnas, you know. This Black Madonna of Malta, most beautiful, beautiful uh, marble. Uh, it's Brown Street marble sculpture of the Madonna in a crypt underneath a floor in a church. This was a cave, an old cave, like that. And she's just, to, I mean, whenever I'm down in that crypt with her, I just go into this state of like another world, you know. Madonna, can be like or something she's called. So this painting is here, which I called uh, African Goddess of the Ancient Paralysic Caves. <clears throat> and there is uh, experience I had of being in, in a, a huge Paralysic cave with uh, sort of uh, carvings and so on in the uh, south of Spain, almost on the coast near Malaga. And I was sitting in this uh, enormous uh, chamber doing some drawings. And, uh, well, the story was to be in that they had found evidence from about a million years old of habitats, rem remnants of habitats of Africans who had come over from North Africa to South Spain. And quite likely they just walked across at the time anyway, a million years ago. There wouldn't have been any water there anyway, probably. And uh, yes, so they were there already then. And in this cave, there is this enormous rock, it looks like the profile, as far as I'm concerned, of an African woman. Mm -hmm. and, and the archaeologists themselves actually call it La Sala de la Diesta, the Hall of the Goddess, to my amazement, in their official literature. Very impressive. What's the name of the place where that is? It's in Andalusia, not far from Malaga, right on the coast. Mm -hmm. And just to show you the sort of vaginal forms and sort of intestinal forms, I mean, of course, the ancient people who lived in the Paralysic case were aware about that they were living in a mother's body. I mean, I've actually seen a film of, like, uh, you know, like sperm and things traveling along inside a, a woman. You know, it looks very much like that when the sort of uterus forms inside, uh, in, into the womb, you know, of, of, a, of a woman. Um, yeah, and I mean, the, the mountain was the mountain mother. You know, and this, of course, is some of the most ancient, uh, the most ancient um, carvings, carved symbols in, in the Paleolithic caves of the Vagina of the Mother. And this is another thing that I did ten years after God gave birth. She had Koshinanagi creation, six foot high, and that used to get banned as well together with God giving birth. 
then we had an exhibition for um, woman magic celebrating the goddess within us who's traveled around Britain and in Europe for about nine years. And the, in fact, that painting and God given birth were taken off the walls in Lancaster, I think it was 1980, uh, in Lancaster, in the, in, it was a coffee bar attached to the theater in Lancaster, and God given birth and his paintings were taken down. And, and the, the man who owned the cafe said, if you are going to have naked women on our walls, let them at least be beautiful and not these monstrosities. <laughs> And that, of course, got into the papers as well as the scandal. <laughs> he had to hitch up, up there really quickly to talk to the press. And apparently, lots of people in Lancaster demanded to see the paintings. <laughs> and like I think it's from Walter and Chateau Luc, ancient Neolithic. So this painting I call Rise the Passage. And it's actually. Stones in the Stone Avenue, uh, Avenue, Stone Avenue, going into the entrance of West Kennedy Lombard, which of course it doesn't in reality, this is just a poetic license. And I walk together, I mean, every one of the stones that I recognize from Stones from Avenue, from the Avery Stone Avenue. But I was weaving together different images from Maria Gilbuta's book, Language of the Goddess, in this painting, without realizing that at the very time I was doing this painting, around Inbolk, 1994, she was dying from cancer. So I call this one now in memory of Maria Gilbuta's, and this painting now hangs in the Maria Gilbuta's archive in California. And the, the, the thing is about this painting is that this little figurine, at but it doesn't look little, it looks big in this painting. Up in the, to the right hand corner, at the top, this figure, you know, we got this with the eyes, like the rain streaming out of the eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was in the Czech Republic, it's the first time I actually seen her in the flesh. And she is this size, that size. And she is found, she was found, I mean, this is most extraordinary. While we were there in the Czech Republic, we were taken down from Prague, three to four hours drive, Moravia, which is down south, to an ancient, to a Neolithic, sorry, not Paleolithic site, dated from about 30,000 to 25,000 BCE, which they only discovered in this century. It's one of the oldest sites in the world, called Dolny Viestonice. I took some time to learn that one. Dolny Viestonice. And this is called the Venus of what, what Dolny Viestonice. I mean, everyone, every time we find this, this, this statue of the figure in the goddess called a Venus, for some ridiculous reason, you know. <laughs> she's not a Venus, she gave birth to the entire tribe for eons. No, I mean, she's not some sort of nubile young woman, you know, or anything like that. And what's more, she wasn't made by men. But you know, the thing is that they found this tiny little statue, figurine, and she's dark, she's made of clay, and fired, fired clay. But I didn't know that people between 30,000 to 25,000 BC, had earth ovens to, you know, to bake clay. I mean, I, I was totally gobsmacked, you know. So they make these pictures of a bearded mumble hunter sitting there making this delicate little... This is so preposterous. It's just unbelievable, you know. <laughs> I mean, everywhere in the museum and all the you know, male shamans and male this and male that. A woman in sight, you know? <laughs> so I was furious at the same time as the lunch did to see this. But of course, it's the first time also I saw the actual bones that the women did in the Roman carvings. You know, Alexander Marshank had this idea that, that he found these bones and pieces of wood, these markings, regular markings made by different instruments, which he thought was the lunar cycle, you know, carved. I mean, who else can a lunar cycle but women, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's very likely, actually, that mental powers developed by women, in women watching a very complicated lunar cycle. It's even called mental powers. Mensis, menstruation, mental powers. It actually gives on the word mental powers, you know? So it's the first time I actually saw these bones in the flesh, you know, down here. And they actually, they weren't living in caves, they were living in, in structures made, they were mummy you know, hunters and gatherers, and, and they had sort of, like, 
or not hands, not teeth, but sort of long structures covered in skins, mum's skins, and then mum's bones. But it's the opposite, you know, and it's the oldest thing I've ever seen, you know, that I've been at this place. And what even more gobsmacked me, which I've never heard of before, is that they found evidence of weaving. I mean, weaving, I'm talking about weaving it, and I'm not talking about sort of knotted fibers and the string baskets, and I'm talking about actual weaving, weft and weave, because they found small textiles imprinted in what would have been wet clay. They didn't find the textiles, of course, they would have rocked it a long time ago, but they found the evidence on imprinted in the clay. With proper sort of, do you know what I mean, like weaving. I, I, I never heard of it. I was totally amazed. I mean, now who would have done that weaving? Mammoth hunters? I mean, you know, women obviously. Well, there wasn't a big picture there of women doing the weaving, believe me. <laughs> anyway, it was amazing them being there. It was extremely interesting. You know? And this is contemporary, by the way, with Malta, Malta in Siberia, which was also mammoth hunters and gatherers. And they had small sculptures to show, you know what I mean, in the museum, they showed <coughs> contemporary sculptures or statues actually of the goddess, you know, from different cultures that were contemporary with the doll in the stone which is So there were tiny little images like this, very delicately carved in the, in, in mammoth bone from Siberia, you know. And I, I, I found, I found a, a friend of mine was uh, in Siberia, and she came back with this extraordinary book in Russian, so I mean, I don't, and I don't understand much Russian, but it's a sort of an um, astrology, as a man who was an astrologer and archaeologist who had been working out on, on, on this tiny wheel of sculptures, statues we got as in carved in mum's bone. He thinks that they have worked out the entire cycle of Venus, dotted all around the heads of the figures on these little statues. Do you know? Well, I don't know anything about astrology, you know, but it's extraordinary. Because, I mean, shamanism, you know, is, 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 is something that kind of originated in Siberia. And he used to talk about Siberian hysteria. <laughs> Siberian hysteria. You know, like there are so special images out in the Arctic. And if the Sami people in the north of Sweden are part of this Arctic, you are not in your head, you know anything well, about just that, that just you heard about resonated it? with Siberia and the Sami yeah, people. Right, yes. oh, I find it absolutely very, 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 very yes. interesting. <laughs> And I would like to know a lot more. It's the first time I got closer to it in this museum. Anyway, that's just an angel, a trusted angel or something, a graveyard, overground with greenery, which is my green woman in the painting. And that, German women, all German women seem to know about this one, is a lioness carved in, uh, what is it, in ebony? Ivory? Ivory. About 33,000 BCE found in a cave in Germany. No one seems to know about this except for in Germany. Are you sure that's not a lynx? What? Are you sure that's not a lynx? Lynx. I don't know that. I don't know that. Whatever, you know. But the point is they're always, always, always dragging out this image of of a so-called male shaman hunter, you know, with horns or whatever. You know, it's been like one of the oldest sort of Shamani got down figures from the caves. Well, this is all there, 33,000 BC, and it's a female figure, yeah? I just found that very interesting, yeah? Oh, there she is, from Dolly's. Well, I didn't have a clue from that picture that she's that size, like that size, you know? And extremely delicate. And that's from Maria de Buddha's book. Well, of course, this is more or less contemporary as well. And of course, we've got another Venus, <laughs> which is like the gigantic earth herself, you know. Another thing, of course, something which is not generally known about the Tory and thought about by, by Western archaeologists, who I would say overall are very racist is that it seems to be a people who came from Africa that African scholars called African Grimaldis, who lived in those ancient Paleolithic caves, who in the Pyrenees, and in France and in Spain, who were the kind of hot and top type pig, pig, I mean, twa, twa people, I mean, pygmy apparently is a put-down word, which means half an arm's length or something like that. 
you know, 12 people, you know, from from southern, uh, from or from the uh, from the uh, from uh, Ethiopia, from the, you know what I mean? Or about two million years ago, a human sort of uh, early human country was evolving in the Odorvai Valley, you know, in East Africa. And <clears throat> so I mean, so these people came. We're living in a cave, so something like 40,000 BC, before the cro arrived in the cave, about 25,000 BC. So quite likely, I mean, the Dolni, the Stonichi and the Malta, the Malta people, were the North African people, possibly, do you know what I mean? You know? So, but of course, the, I mean, I just don't understand at all, you know, even archaeologists would say things like, yes, humanity evolved in Africa, 200,000 BC, you know, then they came over to Europe, and then what? That they just kind of disappeared entirely from history? <laughs> you see what I mean? It, it just does not follow up at all to. Now what happened then? You know, and what about the Neolithic peoples of old Europe? Well, they're not small and dark. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the lack, for example, the Sonic people in the north of Sweden, the Sonic, the Arctic peoples, who are small and dark, well, you said they were the same people, they're a remnant of this old Neolithic, old European peoples. That's what I believe. But it seems to me these old archaeologists are trying to prove all they did. This is sort of pre Celtic peoples, you know, really white and this and so on. Do you know, I mean, the sort of Aryan supremacy archaeologists still at work in Europe. And anyway, my youngest son is mixed race, you know, so I mean, I'm afraid that I do take all this pretty badly myself. But anyway, so you can see these images of these women. A, they have this sort of um, hair, you know what I mean, which is so, what do you call it, uh, crinkly? Crinkly hair. And these huge buttocks of the hot and top women. But look at the uh, so-called Venus of Willendorf. With her uh, crinkly hair, you know, an enormous body. I mean, you know, these African women. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> And apparently these are very, very early Neolithic, or Pal sorry, Paleolithic music instruments found in the caves, in the Pyrenees, mm -hmm. made from like crane spawns or bird spawns. So they were making music at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a painting I call Avery Stone Avenue. And uh, yeah, it's again inspired by the stones in the avenue. And this one is going to be on the cover of next we move, next year's we move. <laughs> Which I'm pleased to know. And this of course is some of the stones in the Amos uh, Avenue. And this is either Dartmoor, Baltimore, I don't know which. Stone Avenue. I never had any kind of explanation. What? Stone Rose, is it? Yes, Stone Rose. Stone Rose, yeah. But the thing is, I've never heard any kind of interpretation of where any sort of much thought about what this actually were. I mean, you can, it's hardly processional. There's hardly any space between the stones. I don't know whether there's Cherry or not. Cherry would know more about this. It's been suggested that it might have been flight paths for, for shamans and shamankas. Spirit paths for the shamans yeah, and Jamaicans to travel. Yeah, I know there's theories, you know, but I mean, I, this sounds to be a bit sort of, why put this, why, why do you need stones put along? A shaman can fly anywhere, you know. Shaman, you don't need the stones on the ground. <laughs> well, it's to direct them back to the earth when they come back from their flight path. <laughs> 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 landing, landing spot. <laughs> I just don't believe that, you know. <laughs> 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 Yeah, where the sun actually at the equinox is immediately in the centre, but it's an angle with you going up. It's at an angle with the earth, so it's actually a very powerful time there. And I thought you perhaps had some theories of your own, sir. You can process up them, actually. I've done so. Sorry. You can process up them. I, I've yeah. done so. Well, there is there is space for for uh, one person to walk up. Yes. I mean, it's not like Avery Stone Avenue. You know what I mean? Which really is a wide space to dance and run and chant and you know. And anyway, and whatever you know, Bob's the boat park. You know. And of course, this is a Karnak. Well, I, I spent uh, three or four days once walking along the stones at Karnak before they were fenced in because 
that now they have defense and need to protect them because it's in so many people walk along that all the time. That all the greenery and all the, all the plants that grew around the stones are getting trampled and destroyed. Which, and that they need to be there to protect the stones, you know, so they can, yeah, you can't actually walk amongst them now in the way you did. But when I was there that time, you could. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's like 10 rows or more, but, you know, going right across the land for many miles. And yeah, again, an extremely powerful. And again, I've never really sort of seen any explanation at all of that. Uh, you know, I mean, how many shamans flights pass through in one place? Quite a few. <laughs> Do you know what I'm like an aerial display team then, don't they? Yeah. Walking on and on, sort of. <laughs> Shamanic version of the red eyes. What? Shamanic version of the red eyes. <laughs> 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 anyway, it's a very powerful case for Janet. I mean, I tend to tell this story, you know, and I'm sure Aswad doesn't like it being told at all. But Aswad and another woman from the Matriarchy study group in London went many years ago to a Karnak on a full moon night and had a wooden mallet with them. And apparently there are three different centres, but they're much larger, so that's three sort of ritual centres, and there's small stones building up the ritual centres, small stones building up the next ritual centre, like in three different places, and they work under these ritual centres, the larger stones. Well, apparently, as for they hit one of the stones with this, net, with this uh, wooden mallet, and it rang like a bell, apparently, and the sound apparently went all the way down the line of stones, that like ringing, and they thought they were imagining things. And they did it again, and the same thing happened. At which point, the Panji Asana got really scared. Then they were in the middle of the night, in the full moon night, surrounded by thousands of stones, and they didn't have a clue what sort of energies they might be waking up or related to or nothing. They just fled, apparently. This is hearsay. This is what I heard. I mean, I love that story. I'm sure Asana would be mortified if she knows <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling this stuff. But I think it's very interesting. It's just very interesting. As an example of, you know, what the point is that you lost the knowledge, haven't you? Mm -hmm. And I've been sort of hoping all along that the scientists will not find out because they will misuse it, misuse it, yeah? Because it's very powerful energies at work. Yeah. That, I mean, I've been traveling to the sacred sites ever since 1978. I mean, it's transformed me, it transformed my life. Extraordinary powers always at work, the spirits always present, the fairies always present, you know. And uh, so it's, it's no laughing matter. I, mean, I know I'm making a joke here, you know, but it's no laughing matter, you know, it's just incredibly, incredibly powerful and important, you know. So anyway. And this is like a round man, the face is like a round man, the great mother. From uh, I can't remember what's it called. Table yeah. de Marchand. What? Table de Marchand. On the island, you know. No, no on the island. That's Gabrini's, isn't yeah, it? Gabrini's, that's right. Yeah, Gabrini's. That's right. Yeah. And I, I haven't actually been there myself. Most places I should say so. I've been visiting myself, but I haven't been to Gabrini. He couldn't get across somehow from. from well, this is a painting that was inspired by Bride Moor up above um, Todd Morden and, uh, and uh, all the other the little town up there. Well, Hepton Bridge. Hepton Bridge, yeah. Just, I was doing a slideshow at Hepton Bridge. And some of the women said, Oh, your paintings remind us of the Bride Stones up on Bride Moor. And I was taken up there by John Billingsley, who had organized this. It was an earth mistress group that I was doing a slideshow. And we were actually, actually up there with the Benyut on Sawin itself. And there was this incredible sky and light and, and the stones, just phenomenal. And the land just really incredibly ancient and vague and just really wild land, very different from, from other places. And I did this painting as a result of being up there. And the thing is, we came back from that being, having been up there and I kind of went to sleep, this was in the afternoon, and I slept that we were back up there. I dreamt that we were back up there, and I was walking towards the stone, but there was this transparent gateway. I passed through this transparent gateway into the fairy realm. It was very, very powerful dream, like a lucid dream again. And ever since then, I've been fascinated by gateways, you know, gateways into our world.
So these are the stones themselves. And that large stone there is called the bride. And the tiny little stone next to it is called the groom. <laughs> <coughs> and, the, and the stones are sort of like almost black on the outside and golden, golden inside. It's very, very, very powerful rocks. High up there. <coughs> I think this, there are so many amazing uh, magic places on these islands, that's for sure. And I tend to think also that perhaps one reason why I had that extraordinary experience when I was given birth is I was given birth in Bristol, which is right in between Bath, Avery, Silbury, and Glastonbury. All I didn't know at the time. But you know, all of half of all this energy is all these different places converging. Anyway, the head in my painting I, I based on one of these uh, cycladic policies, which looks almost like a, a, a sculpture by Van Crucio or something. <coughs> but it's, it's Neolithic. Very simple. So this is a painting I call Gaia or Earth Giantess, which was based on, it's a six foot high painting, and it was based on an enormous rock with water in the sea, the water between the legs and a huge cave behind. It looked like a huge troll stand, a troll woman standing there. A lot of these painters I did also when I was living in Wales, in the cottage in Wales. And of course, uh, Charlie was showing this one. But what I was saying to Maggie was that as I was doing this painting, I was in a chalet in, in Wales, in my grandchildren and, and son and family. And they had a television on, and they were showing this film, Worms. Do you know that one? It's thump, thump, thump from under the ground. And I was listening to this thump, 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 you know? As, and, and that is how that circle came about. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, it, it's, it's your earth dragon, you know? I mean, like, it was just kind of extraordinary, you know? With one ear, I was listening to this thumping in this film, and in the other one, I was doing this. <laughs> 